anything. Uh, you're all very welcome, and uh, so is our speaker tonight, Linda Mathias, who is going to take us on an illustrated tour of St. Asaph Cathedral. So a warm welcome, Linda. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name, as Richard said, is Linda Mathias. My husband was William Mathias, but he wasn't a celebrated musician, so I have no claim to fame. <laughs> as you can see, um, this introduction um, photograph, the top of the cathedral tower is a different colour. In 1714, there was an almighty storm, and it knocked the top off the tower. And when they replaced it, they took it down to a, a level and they replaced it with sandstone, which isn't a very good mixture because the rest is limestone. But that is why the top of the tower is a different colour. This is the west end of the cathedral with the main west entrance. Next. And this, you can see the tower here with the um, different coloured top. The gravestones are for bishops and deans only. The hoi polloi, um, that's like me, um, if I want my ashes there, I can, but it's, it, it's a little corner bit and you don't even get a marker anymore, so it's not worth it. <laughs> As you go into the cathedral, the doors obviously are open. These are the big wooden doors. And nobody looks behind the door, but this is the lock that opens it. It's a bird and you press down on there and that opens the door. But nobody sees it because the door's always open. This is the smallest cathedral in Britain. It's 182 foot from the west door to the high altar and 68 foot wide. Some parish churches are bigger than that. Um, I will say I haven't done a tour like this for three years because of Covid, so if I repeat myself, I apologise. One of the main features about the cathedral is the pillars have no capitals. Sorry, am I in your way there? No. Oh, okay. um, there are no capitals, capitals being the pretty bits you usually see on the top of the um, pillars. But when uh, Dr. Johnson was there, he said, this adds to the grace and elegance of this little cathedral. The ceiling was redone in 1968 to commemorate Charles being made uh, Prince of Wales in 1969, and the bosses were repainted then. The, the roof is made of Welsh oak. Edward I was building his castle here in Rithlan, at the same time that the cathedral was being built. And he thought it would be a good idea to have the cathedral moved from St Asaph to Rithlan, and then he'd have control over the army and the church. Well, you can't just move a cathedral, there has to be a reason. And the reason was his soldiers were passing, and quite by accident, the place went on fire. <laughs> the fact that the soldiers were all carrying boxes of swan vestas indicated that they were not going to happen. So, Anion, who was bishop at the time, had to go to Rome to get permission from the Pope to move the cathedral. Well, he was quite proud of him because he took his time getting there, and when he got to Rome, Pope Martin IV was dead, so the cathedral was never moved. Which pleased <laughs> Us, but Edward I wasn't very happy. He promised 7,000 marks for the cathedral to be rebuilt here in Rithland, but he gave 100 pounds when it was rebuilt in St. Um, when you see the full length of this uh, effigy, his arms were holding were back like this, and in one hand he had an oar, and in the other he had his crozier. Well, to stay for all eternity like that was a bit hard on him, so they put an angel to hold his arms up on each side. Unfortunately, Cromwell's men bashed the arms out anyway. Um, but he, the angel is still there, and that's her face, and those are her toes, and she's still sitting there, but she's got no arms to hold up. 
Our most um, celebrated treasure is the Welsh Bible. Henry VIII had had the Bible translated from Latin into English for all the churches, for the priests only to read, which was a fat lot of good to the Welsh because they couldn't understand it. So Elizabeth I, Elizabeth I had the Bible translated from the original by William Morgan, and it was the old. This is the Welsh Bible. This is printed in 1588. It's now in a glass cabinet. Uh, I actually took these photographs, and that's why they're not very good. And I'm not a very good photographer. Um, it was printed in 1588, and it was translated from the original. So it's Hebrew into Welsh for the Old Testament, and Greek into Welsh for the New Testament. And then in 1620, this Bible was printed. It wasn't a retranslation, but it was a correction of the Welsh, because this had been printed in London, and they wouldn't have known if they were making mistakes or not. So that was printed in 1620, and it was more sort of people-friendly Welsh. And that's Welsh as it's spoken today, it hasn't changed since then. And then in 1630, for the princely sum of five shillings, this is not a Bach, a Bach being a little Bible, for five, but this is the size of the Bach. You could buy a Bible, and I'm sure you all know the famous story of Mary Jones, who couldn't afford shoes but saved five shillings and bought it to Bala to buy her Bible. And that's the cabinet that they've now got it in. It's heat proof, damp proof, beetle proof, everything proof. And this is a digital one and you can press buttons and you can turn the pages of the Bible. It's really good. Again, this was all closed down, of course, for two years. And outside, this is the monument for all those who were involved with the translation. William Morgan did the, the main Bible, but then the 1620 Bible was Salisbury, Davis, Parry and others. And they've all got a, a spot round this monument. It's supposed to be a lantern to lighten our darkness. And each one of them on those plaques has his um, uh, qualifications and that sort of thing. William Morgan, of course, has the front spot. And as you can see, it's very popular with school children. This um, um, slab of marble is quite interesting because the family is called, the, the sculptors are called Westmacott. There are three generations. And this one, the, I think this is the youngest one, he was the first to have angels with their feet off the ground so that angels flew. It's, um, it obviously must be quite a good one because in Buckingham Palace Gardens, if ever you've been there, they've got a, an absolutely enormous flower pot. Um, if you stand, well, if I stand in front of it, I'm not as tall as the plinth, so that gives you some idea of how big the pot is. And that was by Westmacott, and that was to commemorate those who fought in the Battle of Waterloo. We're back to this. Could you go on from that? This is one of the pillars. This is not medieval <coughs> graffiti. These are masons' marks. The masons were probably illiterate, so the master mason would leave instruction and then the mason would carve his mark and that would be his his bill as well as the fact to prove that he had done the work. Okay. They're all over the cathedral. Oh yes, and these black marks are called telltales. In 1917 they found that the, uh, 1915 they found that the tower was sinking and there were cracks all over the cathedral. So they dug up under the tower and filled it up with <coughs> concrete, I suppose, whenever you fill up a big hole to stop towers falling down. And on all the cracks, they put these telltales. I think they're lead, but I'm not too sure. 
and the date is on it, and if there's any movement in the cathedral, those will break. But they haven't moved, and there's been no movement, and there's not one break since 1915, so we feel quite safe for Sunday services. This is the scene, as I said, it's the well show, and these are the bosses. And this is a close-up of the bosses, and everyone is different. In the name, there are 48, and in the presbytery there are 55, and that's because the presbytery is absolutely um, symmetrical, whereas this has got all sorts of bits sticking around it. But these are, that's one of the bosses close up. And that is in the, uh, that's the middle of it. Oh, I can't that anyway, it's another boss. <laughs> and at the bottom, uh, where the stays sort of come down from the, the roof, <coughs> um, these are the core bells. And there are four that are marked like this. This one has toothache. He's got his hand over his mouth. His elbow is hurting. <laughs> this these are the um, medieval cannon stores. They're 15th century, and they're the only medieval canopied cannon stores in North Wales. Okay. As you can see, quite a few choristers in days gone by left their mark. If you can see here, Felix Powell, he and his brother George were choristers. And they grew up and stopped being vandals. And <coughs> they went in for a competition in 1914 to write a patriotic song. And they won. And their song was called Pack Up Your Troubles in Your Own Kit Bag. <laughs> Felix Powell fought in the First World War, but George was a pacifist. And when it came to the Second World War, George was still a pacifist, but Felix was um, in the Home Guard. And in uniform uh, with his own gun, he had his own life. So he obviously had not got over the first one. That's a closer, a better um, showing of it. Above the, this is the other side of the, obviously the um, cabin stores are on either side. This is the other side. And could you do this? This is William Franklin. And William Franklin designed these, and he left his mark by leaving his head behind. This has always been called the man in the bowler hat, but in fact it was probably the equivalent nowadays of a hard hat, but it was probably just a little leather skull cap. That's a better one of him. And the seats in the cannon stalls are his airy cords. That just means mercy seats. And when you tip them up, this is what you see, that is the seat. And on the, that side is the master carpenter has uh, done that piece of carpentry. And this is the apprentice copying. Am I in the way? Okay. This is the, the, the apprentice. The, all the uh, seats have these carvings. They're all quite simple. But they're not all the same. But this is the only one that lifts easily because as they're 15th century, they tend to jam. So rather than force them, <coughs> they jam. Oh, but that's because of the size of the misery courts, the, the monks were not allowed to sit. And when you get to nine o'clock at night, when they'd probably been up at five in the morning and they were doing Conklin at nine o'clock, they were probably tired. So all they could do was rest their bottoms on the, these seats. If I do it, it looks as if I'm sitting. And just to show the difference in height, that was the door, so you can see how little they must have been, because I don't think I even have the heels on. So it's quite a small door, that's the only reason I'm on that. Um, the window in the cabin, in the presbytery, uh, above this one, is, uh, dedicated to Felicia Hemmings. Felicia Hemmings was a poetess. Not many people have heard of her, but she wrote a huge amount of poetry. Her most famous poem was called Casabianca, and not many people have heard of that. 
But the first words of Casabianca are, the boys were on the burning deck when all but he had fled. And she lived in St. Arthur <coughs> for a time, and as you can see, she died in Dublin when she was 40. I thought, um, when I was in school, I am of the age where we learnt poetry off by heart, and there was reams of it. And I thought, when I learnt the boys were on the burning deck, I knew a lot. But in fact, it's about this long, and I probably learnt the first <coughs> verse. <laughs> This window is dedicated to Felicia Helens by her sons. On the left, it's Miriam giving the thanks because they got out of Egypt. And on this side, it's Deborah. And she's giving thanks because they beat the Canaanites. And if you look at Deborah's knees, that one looks a lot fatter than this one. And this one's at a funny angle. And I think probably it was two artists who were working on it. And if you notice as well, she has two feet on the plinth and another one behind. So maybe she was in a three-legged race. <laughs> um, but it's more likely that it was two artists because if you, with the lead, they'd have to work it out and then only when they put it together that they'd have seen the difference. That's just to say it's dedicated to Felicia Hemmings. And these are called, oh dear, my mind's gone blank. I'll come back to it, Liz. <laughs> um, again. This is the east window. Up the, in the middle, this is the ascension and then Christ in majesty. And then these six little windows are from Matthew 25. When Jesus said to the disciples, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was in prison, did you visit me? When I was sick, did you comfort me? And those are the six windows there. And then these big windows, the top left is the nativity, then the baptism, and the sermon on the mount. Then on this side, do not touch me, Christ giving Peter the crook, and the road to Emmaus. And then under here, the Good Samaritan, the Foolish Virgins, cast your net on the other side, the women at the tomb, the crucifixion, and the road to Calvary. This, this window, the baptismal window, can you do the next one? I think it's somewhere. Yes. Under Christ's left foot, you can see this lily, and etched on here is a frog. It's not uh, a. Oh dear, what do you call it? Not copyright. Um, it's not a sign of his work. <coughs> Excuse me. The son of the um, artist wanted a frog. <coughs> I'm sorry. And he couldn't change the picture, so he etched the frog on them. And there you can see the frog. Go back to this. <coughs> Sorry. this was the, the window to whom it was uh, dedicated. William Carey was the bishop at the time. Um, and um, the, the window was dedicated to him. The Reredos is by William Earp, and it's made of Derbyshire alabaster. On the left is the women of the tomb, and on the right are the soldiers, and of course the um, crucifixion in the room. Okay. And that, you can see the whole of the Reredos there. Oh, this is the bishop's... Uh, I can't see it. Oh, thank you. <coughs> Yes, this is the bishop's throne with the Pentecostal flames at the top. So, it's seeing it straight on, it you can't see the depth of it. Okay. Oh, and under the bishop's throne, but um, William Morgan is buried. Well, it can't be that 
uh, throat because that's 19th century. Gilbert Scott took over and completely refurbished the cathedral in the 19th century. Up until then, it had been completely flat and he put steps up to the high altar. Before that, as I say, it had been completely flat and William Morgan would have been buried probably where the high altar is or sort of lower down between these stalls in the canon stalls. Could you go back one minute? Oh, you can just see it over <coughs> here. There's a plaque and that is dedicated to John Owen. <coughs> John Owen was um, bishop, was chaplain to Charles I. And when Charles I lost his head, he lost his job. So he became bishop here. And he refused not to do mass every day. So he was taken to the Tower of London. But he didn't die there. He died in Rhythland. But he's buried under the bishop's throne, wherever that might be, in the country. Okay. Okay. This is the Canon Residentiaries store. And on the ends here are... <coughs> <laughs> a green man. There's one. If you turn it, go on. That's it. This is a green man, and there are lots of stories about this. <clears throat> the root always goes through the mouth, and that's what makes it a green man. They're supposed to be pagan, but there are far too many of them in religious places for them to be pagan. There is one story that a a um, German cult said that when Adam was buried, they put the root through his mouth, which grew into the tree of life and became the wood for the cross. It's all very airy fairy, but that's the sort of thing that one of the stories that they have. This is with this window is dedicated to Kentigan and Asaph. Kentigan was the one who started it all. He was Bishop of Strathclyde, but he fell out with the local gentry and he went south, probably by boat, to Pembrokeshire, where he met St David's. He then came north and started the community in St Asa, probably where the parish church is, at the bottom of the hill, because there would be the river and there would be the hill behind to protect. He went back to Glasgow and left Asaf in charge. So that is why we are St Asaf. Kentigan was, it's very difficult to give an accurate account of the beginnings of Christianity in St Asaf because there's no written or archaeological evidence before the 12th century. And then Julian of Norwich wrote it and that was just bits and pieces from previous writings. So legends and mythology are sort of mixed. Kentigern's mother was Saint Thenu, and her father was King Loth, who gave his name to the Lothians. And King Loth decided that his daughter should marry his older brother, which, not surprisingly, she didn't sort of fancy that much. But he, he, he went to him. Uh, his brother tried and she said no. Loth said, pursue her, get her pregnant, she'll have to marry you. So he did, and she was, but she wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, being a strict father, he did what all fathers do when their daughters disobey. He put her in a cart and pushed her off a cliff. <laughs> and the cart, surprisingly, landed on its wheels, which proved, of course, she was a witch. So she was then put in a boat, pushed off into the Firth of Forth, and just left to it. But she landed in Fife, and she was taken in by St. Serf. And when the baby was born, she, he was brought up by Max, and he was called Kentigan, but the mother was told in um, Edinburgh Castle as well, in St. Margaret's Chapel. So again, you can see the myth from things. And then Asa, um, Kentigan had one of these sort of rather strange habits 
of doing penance by kneeling in the river all night, saying his prayers, which not surprisingly uh, didn't do his health much good. So he had hypothermia, and Asaf tried to warm him up, but he had nothing to carry the coals and the embers to warm him up. So he carried them in his robes and in his arms, and he wasn't burnt. So those are their two miracles. Okay. Um, on either side of the um, organ, they have these um, fretwork, just for prettiness. But at the time, the organist had a cat and he wanted his cat immortalised, so that's his cat. And then on the other side, yeah, there's a fish for Sadasi, of course, and we also have a, a squirrel, and I can't remember the other one. Oh, an owl, because they were in the cathedral grounds. <coughs> this is, um, when you go stand under the tower and look up, that is what you see. This circle here, it doesn't look it from the floor, but looking up, that is easily big enough for a man to fall through. It's about this big. So you can, and this square here all comes out. So that if you wanted to put things up into the room above, there are two rooms in the tower, you could do that. And on Remembrance Sunday in 2018, they took that middle circle out and two children from Glancluid School read out the names of all those who had died in the, the two, I think it was just the two wars, and they dropped petals while the choir sang. It was very, very emotive. Oh yes, that's the fish in the ring. These are the ones in the corner, in the, uh, under the tower. Devil of Peace, the Pentecostal Flames, and the, the, the keys of St. Asaph. There's, there are two stories for this. The keys are different. One story is, one is the key for Kentigan and one is the key for Asaph. And the other story is, one is the key for heaven and one is the key for hell. Well, as stewards of the cathedral, we wear um, enamelled medallions round our necks. And the keys are the same, so we just hope we've got the right ones. <laughs> This is the oldest window in the cathedral, and it used to be the east window, but this was taken out and it's in various churches around the diocese. They're, um, for, uh, the coat of arms are for barons. They weren't peers of the realm, but it did mean it gave them the title of baron. And they always have a red hand to show it, but it mustn't be mixed apparently with the red hand of Ulster. But I'm not too sure which way round they're going. And these are all the coat of arms there. This is called um, the Naked Christ. It is not supposed to represent Christ on the cross. It's supposed to represent the horrors of man. And it's by an artist, a local artist, called Michelle Coxon. She writes children's books and illustrates them, and they're absolutely superb. She also does postcards, um, birthday cards and greetings cards, and they're fluffy pussycats with lots of flowers or with knitting bags and things like that, and little puppy dogs with flowers all around them. So they're incredibly twee, pretty. <laughs> the books are, are not like that, the books are lovely. And then there's this. And she was in Serbia and she saw some pretty horrible things. And this is why she's called, you know, the horrors of man. But it is known as the naked Christ. This is the Spanish Madonna. 1588 was the year that the Welsh Bible was printed and it was also the year of the Spanish Armada. When the ships had finished fighting in the channel, they couldn't just turn and go back to Spain because they were sailing ships and they had to go with the wind, which was literally right round Britain. Well, this particular ship survived the battles but went down on Anglesey. And this uh, little Madonna was found on the beach of Tallinn. 
and it was in the Gladstone family um, in Harden. And then in 1920, when the church was disestablished from the Church of England, it was presented to us. They say it's 16th century. When the Renaissance started in the 14th century, with people like Giotto and Simone Martini, um, Cimabue, from then on, the Christ child became a baby. Before that, he was a little man. Well, he's definitely a little man. So I think it's much older, but nobody listens to me, so <laughs> <laughs> it stays as a 16th century statue. It's ivory, and it's in incredible condition. It's about that big. It looks as if it's a big, 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 but it's not. It's only about that big, and it's set in the wall, and it has got glass in front of it, so it's quite safe. This is called the Tree of Life. Unfortunately, it's not there anymore, but it has been. And it was uh, commissioned by the German Catholic Church for the people of Haiti. And it, it's called the Hunger Cloth. Henry Morton Stanley, known as John Romans. He was born to um, a girl called, I think it was Mary, Harry. And her father, um, her mother was dead, and I have just recently heard a completely new aspect to Henry Morton Stanley, because I thought that he had sort of told such haughty lies about his past that you couldn't believe anything that was said. But in fact, because he was illegitimate, in those days this was one of the most heinous crimes that any child could be blessed with. Never the parents, of course, but always the child that was illegitimate. So of course he wanted to hide it. And he made up the, the um, Stanley, the Henry, Henry Pope Stanley, from whom he was supposed to have taken his name. He was, he was brought up in the workhouse in St. Asaph, and he went off I thought to Virginia, but in fact he went to Missouri and he worked and he worked. He also fought on both sides in the Civil War, um, but he, he was self-educated and everyone knows that he did quite well as an explorer and as a journalist. So I'll have to mug up on the new evidence because I've changed my mind about him now. So that's Henry Morton Stanley, and here, as you see, he's buried in perfect purple. Okay. This is the lectern, the eagle with the arms welcoming everyone. Um, I don't clean that. Somebody else does it, and they do it another way. Okay. The pulpit is um, 19th century, and it has. And the four apostles and Christ in the middle. The font, um, during the um, Cromwell's time, the soldiers used the nave for his horses and cattle, and they bashed out all the stained glass windows. So all the stained glass is Victorian. The font was used for um, watering his cattle. The, the horses and cattle have the name during the winter. This is the site that has not been restored and it was found in the River Elwyn. Uh, you can just see this site which has been restored, restored but I think the old site is more interesting. Okay. This window is the west window over the, west, the big west door. The flags are the four dioceses of Wales. Bottom left is Llandaff uh, in Cardiff, Bangor, St David, St Asaph, Swansea and Brecon, and Monmouth. On the left is St David, and on the right is Archbishop Edwards, and he was the first Archbishop of Wales. The first, the window was dedicated originally. Um, to one of the deans, I think his name is Williams, uh, Roman Williams, because he stopped the cathedral being amalgamated with Bangor. 
But this actual window was dedicated to Archbishop Edwards, who died in 1939, uh, 1937. And the window was put in in 1941. Can you imagine, in the middle of a world war, they put in a stained glass window? It's too strange. <coughs> and that's the close-up of them. This plaque uh, is really rather interesting because it's dedicated to women. None of them was associated with the cathedral, and we don't know why they're there. <coughs> the, the families were all given £25 as um, compensation, except for Margaret Dorothy Edwards, who had been brought up by nuns, and because she didn't have family, the nuns didn't get anything for her. They all died. One was shot, but I'm not too sure which one. Two of them were, uh, they were all separate, they, nothing happened together. One died of typhoid or cholera six weeks after she joined them. Uh, two, on separate occasions, were taking soldiers back and their ship was blown up. One was actually in the harbour that had been cleared of mines, but there was one there and that was blown up. But every woman who fought in the First World War is uh, memorialised in York Minster. They have a huge plaque and everyone is mentioned. And this is thanks to the lottery. We have this new um, history that everyone can see. This is Gilbert Scott and this is um, Felicia Hendon. Um, I can't see it at this angle. But anyway, it's very interesting and you can see exactly what's there all together. And this is for the children. They can make a stained glass window. This is supposed to light up as, as every child who comes and presses the button. The bulb lasts about 10 minutes and it has been replaced so many times I don't think they got here anymore. But they, the, the bits are all there and the children like doing it. So do the adults actually. Now this painting is in the North Chapel, which used to be called the Translator's Chapel. <coughs> now, um, Andrea Del Sarto, he did quite a few paintings, but this one was the most famous. This is only a copy, of course. The real thing is in um, the Uffizi in Florence. It was originally made as a uh, the back of the altar for a, con uh, for a convent. It's called the Madonna of the Harpies, and the Harpies are these figures on the pedestal, and it's St John and St Francis on either side. This is the, the one in our cathedral, but the, the one in the Uffizi has been cleaned and the colours are jewel-like, they're really brilliant. I don't think I've got a picture of it. No. This is one of the bishops. When they dug up the... Uh, we have a new tea room and before that there were two graves and they had to, to preserve the graves properly because they were bishops. And this was the coat of arms that was on top of one of them, so this is now inside the cathedral. Okay. And this is the patch. That's the old vestry, I think. Yeah, this is the old vestry here. And this is the corridor. It's difficult when it's changed, isn't it, to see it? Anyway, that was the where it was dug out. And this is, we had one lavatory in the cathedral. And when we had the music festival, or an ordination, or a confirmation, Every child always wants to go to the room, you can imagine. Well, every adult does, especially my age. Um, you can imagine that the, the queues were uh, terrible. Now we've got 11, and they're unisex, so nobody has to queue. It's wonderful. And this is the tea room, which is very busy all the time, and that is instead of all that rubble at the back. Okay. And Nathaniel Ryan and Arden took the photographs, except for the awful ones, and I took them. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, Nat died of uh, uh, pancreatic cancer just a couple of years ago. This is called the, the Nativity, and it's by a monk um, from St. Binance. 
He's Father Rory uh, Dagan. He's the happiest, nicest, most cheerful individual you've ever come across. He's quite poorly, but he's nearly 90. And it starts off with chicken wire and plaster, and it was on loan to us, but somebody in the congregation bought it, so we have it now for good. I think that's it. Just turn it on. Just to check. That's it. Okay. Well, there you are, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, I'll see if I can answer them. If I can't, I've got a talk to you. <laughs>